nice to meet you. Fearfully fascinating subject. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 crazy Harry Potter details you missed. That's a full glass. Let's me keep an eye on my enemies. For this list, we'll be looking at the ingenious bits of foreshadowing that can be found in the Harry Potter series. Spoiler warning ahead for those who haven't read the books, not all of these details were included in the films. Do you think these were planned out or just magical coincidences? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Dumbledore's Connection to Neville Throughout the series, Hogwarts's headmaster seems to focus solely on Harry. However, he has a close connection to another Gryffindor that many never noticed. At the end of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Dumbledore awards 10 points to Gryffindor for Neville's bravery in standing up to his friends. But a great deal more to stand up to your friends. I award 10 points to Neville Longbottom. At first, it seems like Dumbledore is just trying to overturn Slytherin's victory. However, in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, we learn that it took Dumbledore decades to work up the courage to confront his friend Grindelwald. I've always prized myself on my ability to turn a phrase. Words are, in my not-so-humble opinion, our most inexhaustible source of magic. He must have truly respected Neville for succeeding where he struggled. Number 19. Draco the Matchmaker Draco Malfoy would be mortified to know that he predicted two of the biggest Harry Potter couples. In Chamber of Secrets, after Ginny defends Harry, Draco taunts that she must be Potter's new girlfriend. Famous Harry Potter. Can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. Leave him alone. Oh, look, Potter. You've got yourself a girlfriend. At this point, Harry only sees Ginny as Ron's little sister, but eventually their relationship would shift to one of romance. Malfoy could also apparently see the sparks fly between Ron and Hermione, because in Prisoner of Azkaban, when the two are looking at the Shrieking Shack, Malfoy asks if they're shopping for their new home. Well, well, look who's here. You two shopping for your new dream home? Bit grand for you, isn't it, Weaselby? Don't your family sleep in a uh, one room? Of course, this is meant as a jab, but it is sort of weird that he predicted things twice. We assume Ron and Hermione's first home was a little nicer than the Shrieking Shack, at least. Number 18, The House of a Dying Man. Harry Potter. Serious. <laughs> when Harry finally ends up at the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix, it's not quite what he expected. Even though it's the home of his godfather, Grimald Place is gloomy, dark, and dank. In fact, Book Harry compares the atmosphere to, quote, entering the house of a dying person. Although this could certainly just be an on-point metaphor, it's hard not to see the grim foreshadowing of Sirius Black's future after knowing it happens. Harry, time to go. When all this is over, we'll be a proper family. We'll see. As it turns out, it was exactly like entering the house of a dying person. Number 17, The Room of Requirement. We love the little hints in the books for faithful readers, and The Room of Requirement definitely fits that bill. While chatting with Igor Karkaroff in Goblet of Fire, Dumbledore mentions this magical location. He explains that one time he was in desperate need of a chamber pot, and the castle provided an entire room of them, and that he would later be unable to find the room again. The Room of Requirement only appears when a person has real need of it, and is always equipped for the seeker's needs. So, say you really needed the toy. On the surface, this seems like just another fun demonstration of the headmaster's conversational quirkiness and the castle's curious nature. However, it all starts to make sense in Order of the Phoenix when the Room of Requirement becomes a big plot device. That is the general idea. It's brilliant. It's like Hogwarts wants us to fight back. In fact, Harry himself makes the connection when Dobby explains the room's function. Number 16, Family Relations. Keeping track of magical family trees in the Harry Potter series can get a little confusing. After all, not all of them are printed on a bedroom wall like in the Black family home. This is the Black family tree. My deranged cousin. I hated the lot of them. Luckily, we come to understand that Harry Potter is a descendant of the Peveril family, the three brothers in the story of the Deathly Hallows, through the tradition of passing down the Cloak of Invisibility. From Ignotus, it traveled down all the way to Harry. Since Tom Riddle's grandfather had the Resurrection Stone as a family heirloom, it can be assumed it was also passed down to him from the Peverils. 
If that's true, Voldemort and Harry Potter could be distant relatives. That would definitely be an awkward family reunion. What if it's allegiance was always to someone else? Oh, come on, Tom. Let's finish this the way we started. Together. Number 15, That Awful Boy. After Harry and Dudley are attacked by Dementors, Aunt Petunia lets slip that she knows the soul-sucking creatures guard the wizard prison Azkaban. Appalled at herself, Harry's aunt quickly explains that she heard about it from that awful boy. We have a witch in the family. Isn't it wonderful? I was the only one to see her for what she was. A freak. Everyone assumed she was referring to her late brother-in-law, James Potter. However, in the final book, we learn that Snape knew Lily and Petunia when they were all children, and that Petunia picked up her magical trivia while spying on the two. Freak! If Petunia had actually used the wizard's name, maybe she and Harry could have bonded over their shared dislike of Professor Snape. Number 14, Faux Glass Foreshadowing. If I can see the whites of their eyes, they're standing right behind me. <laughs> Wouldn't even bother telling you what's in there. Until that pivotal peek into Snape's memories in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, his allegiance was hotly debated. However, there was a very clear hint in the fourth book for those who knew where to look. After the Dark One's return, Harry is taken to recover from his ordeal in Professor Moody's office. Harry sees McGonagall, Dumbledore, and Snape in the paranoid Professor's faux glass. The revelation that the deranged Barty Crouch Jr. had been impersonating Moody in order to help Voldemort makes this a very important detail. Barty Crouch Jr. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Your arm, Harry. Since a faux glass shows the owner's enemies, it confirms that Snape was on the opposite side of the Death Eaters. Number 13, Myrtle Knows. Moaning Myrtle is well known at Hogwarts for hanging out in bathrooms. Although not the best location for making new friends, it does frequently give her the inside scoop. It's not surprising then that the ghost was the first to know about an imposter at Hogwarts. When she approaches Harry during his bath in Goblet of Fire, Myrtle asks if he and his friends have been making polyjuice potion again. I was circling a blocked drain the other day and could swear I saw a bit of polyjuice potion. Not being a bad boy again, are you, Harry? Harry is so focused on his Triwizard task and taken aback at being interrupted in the bath that he doesn't press Myrtle for exactly what she means. Maybe if Harry had asked for a few more details, however, he'd have known about Barty Crouch Jr. much earlier. It was you from the beginning. You put my name in the Goblet of Fire. You bewitched Crumb, but you, 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 you won because I made it so butter. Number 12, a nightmarish prediction. After his very first day at Hogwarts, Harry has a crazy nightmare. In it, he's wearing Professor Quirrell's turban and it keeps telling him to transfer to Slytherin. Since Harry was anxious about his encounter with the Sorting Hat, this dream seems understandable. But where to put you? Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh? However, by the end of Philosopher's Stone, this dream seems way too detailed to be a coincidence. And how did Harry make this wild realization in his dreams? It could also have been an early hint at the connection created by the piece of Voldemort's soul that lives in Harry. In the future, his ability to learn about the Dark One in dreams would become very important. I expect you now realize that you and Voldemort have been connected by something other than fate since that night in Godric's Hollow all those years ago. Number 11, Snape's Hidden Message. In his very first potions class, Harry is peppered with questions by Professor Snape. It seems like the cranky teacher is just picking on the famous student. The questions are so difficult, there isn't a chance that any first year could know the answers. Well, except Hermione. The first impossible question concerns Asphodel and Wormwood, and is more than just a set of potions ingredients. Tell me, what would I get if I added powdered root of Asphodel to an infusion of Wormwood? You don't know? Once you learn that Asphodel is a type of lily and Wormwood symbolizes regret and sorrow, it's hard to miss this secret message. Snape is telling Lily's son exactly how he feels about her death. When paired with the last thing he expresses to Harry, it's truly an incredible set of bookend moments. You have your mother's eyes. Number 10, Myrtle's Murderer. What do you want? To ask you 
how you died. In Chamber of Secrets, Harry, Ron, and Hermione are working to solve the mystery of what is petrifying their fellow students at Hogwarts. Along the way, they come across something curious in the trophy room, an award with Tom Riddle's name on it which he won for services to the school. While they're hypothesizing about what this could mean, Ron jokes that maybe he was the one who killed Moaning Myrtle and says that would have done everyone a favor. Sure. Let's all throw books at Myrtle because she can't feel it. 10 points if you get it through her stomach! 50 points if it goes through her head! In the end, though, that's exactly what happened, because Tom Riddle was the one who opened the Chamber of Secrets. We're pretty sure that's not what the award was for, though. I realized it was a boy speaking, so I unlocked the door to tell him to go away, and I died. Number 9. Correspondence Confusion Take my arm. Do as I say. In the sixth book, Albus Dumbledore comes to Number 4 Privet Drive to collect Harry during the summer. While there, he of course makes the Dursleys very uncomfortable, but also drops a hint to something readers wouldn't learn more about until the final book. When he sees Petunia, he says, We have corresponded, of course, which could have simply referred to a howler that he sent to their house once. We later find out, though, that Petunia wrote to Hogwarts when she was a child, disappointed that her sister was offered admission when she was not. I'm gonna tell Mummy! You're free! Number 8. Who Broke the Vanishing Cabinet? The object that Draco is so interested in is a vanishing cabinet. A vanishing cabinet? Much of the sixth book revolves around Harry's attempts to prove that Malfoy is up to something sinister at Hogwarts. In the end, we find out that, of course, Harry was right all along and Malfoy had been attempting to fix a broken vanishing cabinet in order to transport Death Eaters into the school. Several books earlier, when Harry's having a confrontation with Filch, he hears Peeves the Poltergeist drop a large cabinet above the caretaker's office. Perhaps these two cabinets are one and the same? If so, that's some seriously subtle foreshadowing. Harmonia Nectary passes. Number 7. Snape's Last Words Hide her. Hide them all. I beg you." Longtime fans of the series probably recall the fact that for many years before the final book was published, it was hinted that there would be an important meaning behind the fact that Harry had his mother's eyes. This finally came to fruition in the final chapters of Deathly Hallows, when with his dying breaths, Snape says to Harry, "'Look at me.'" Only later do we find out about Snape's feelings for Harry's mother Lily when Harry delves into the professor's memories. It's never explicitly spelled out, but you can assume that Snape wanted the last thing he saw to be the eyes of the woman he loved. Look at me. Number 6. Snowball Fight Who is that? This delightful Easter egg must have been intentional. During the winter of Harry's first year at Hogwarts, he watched Fred and George Weasley bewitch snowballs to follow Professor Quirrell around and bounce off the back of his turban. Of course, at the end of the first book, we learn that Lord Voldemort has partially taken over Quirrell's body, and his face is situated at the back of the professor's head. Now, you can reread that passage and laugh while you imagine snowballs hitting Voldemort right in the face. Harry! <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell, Harry. Number 5. The Gleam of Triumph I put you in terrible danger this year, Harry. I'm sorry. At the end of Goblet of Fire, when Harry has just escaped his encounter with Voldemort in the graveyard, he's discussing his experience with Dumbledore when something curious happens. Harry notices a, quote, gleam of something like triumph in the headmaster's eyes. Considering readers had to wait three years for the next book to come out, they had plenty of time to speculate about this oh-so-subtle hint. It was only in the final novel, though, that this was finally clarified, because Voldemort using Harry's blood for his resurrection meant that he would never be able to kill him. Number 4. The Three Brothers There were once three brothers who were traveling along a lonely winding road at twilight. In Deathly Hallows, Harry learns of the tale of the three brothers. The brother who chose the Elder Wand wanted power, the brother who chose the Resurrection Stone longed for his lost love, and the brother who chose the Invisibility Cloak greeted death like an old friend. These characters are mirrored by three of the major players in the Harry Potter books, Voldemort, Snape, and Harry himself. Voldemort wanted power, Snape loved and lamented the loss of Lily, and in the end, Harry showed that he was not afraid of death. Who, by the way, may be the part Dumbledore plays in all this. He then greeted death as an old friend, 
Number 3. A Horcrux Hint I am Professor Trelawney. Together we shall cast ourselves into the future. This is one of those tiny details that could possibly be a coincidence, or could be a well-buried hint. Professor Trelawney is making predictions about Harry and hazards a guess that he was born in midwinter. This is, of course, wrong because his birthday is July 31st. Readers could just take this as one of the many examples of Trelawney being a bit of a crackpot. Have I said something? Interestingly, though, Voldemort's birthday is December 31st, which is midwinter. And in Deathly Hallows, we find out that a part of Voldemort has always been within Harry. Could it be that she was sensing someone else's birthday? My dear, you have the grim. Number 2. Plausible Predictions If you ask me, divination's a very woolly discipline. While trying to get through their divination homework in Goblet of Fire, Harry and Ron put in the least amount of effort possible by making up wildly bold predictions, all of which involve horrible things happening to Harry. The thing is, though, as the story unfolds, all of these things come to pass. They say he will be in danger of burns, which corresponds to the first task of the Triwizard Tournament, that he will lose a treasured possession, which corresponds to the second, and that he will come off worse in a fight, which is essentially what happens when he encounters Voldemort in the graveyard. Are your minds blown yet? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Unlucky 13 Innocent blood shall be spilt, and servant and master shall be reunited once more. At Christmas in Prisoner of Azkaban, Professor Trelawney won't sit down for dinner because that would make for a group of 13, which would mean the first person to rise from the table would die. Everyone dismisses her folly, but in actuality there already were 13 people around the table if you include Peter Pettigrew disguised as Ron's rat scabbers. Dumbledore was the first to rise and also the first of the group to die. In Book 5, there are 13 people dining together when Sirius is the first to rise, which foreshadows his untimely death. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.